All right, great. So it's been, what, like a year since I talked with you? Uh, well, we've talked here and there, but... Yeah, we've kept in touch. Since, like, I've actually been able to sit down and get an interview with you. So, um, when I first met you, you were out here with your partner. Um, well, it was midnight, but now it's Vox. And they finally found their name. And they found their name. Um... Both of you are transgender, and um, you went on somewhat of a, a, a journey over the year, and you remained together. Yep. And um, Midnight is now Fox, mm -hmm. and you're still out here in the city, still homeless, working on finding some opportunities. So tell me um, what transpired over the last year, you and Fox, on your journey. Well, we've traveled a bit. We wound up in Florida, um, down in Miami. Um, we wound up in uh, St. Petersburg, visiting his mother and his younger sister. Okay, family. Which, that didn't go so well, unfortunately. Um, it went good between Vox and his younger sister, but between him and his mother, it just, um, it didn't work out. So we went back to Miami for a bit. I, uh, wound up in court as the victim of domestic violence from my spouse, who I just have been trying to be very amicable with throughout trying to get these divorce papers filed and so your spouse lives, lived out in Florida as well. Well now she lives in Georgia. Okay. So right. and where else? Like like how, how was it staying out there in Florida? Uh, Horrible. It's there's no real assistance out there either. Florida has become a state full of hatred actually. It's become uh, anti-LGBTQ, er, extremely anti-trans, and I mean prolifically anti-trans. Um, it's also started arresting the homeless just because they have nowhere to go. Um, rent costs are skyrocketing. Housing programs now have a one-year waiting period. Um, and you would have to be chronically homeless for at least five years before you could even qualify for any sort of housing assistance or rental assistance. The only way past that down in Florida is if you have a job and you already have first, last, and security ready to be put down. I think this one died on it. Possibly. So, I just think my mic died, so I'm going to have to really speak up into the... Uh, I'll continue this interview. I'm going to have to speak up into the phone. So, um... So, how was it, like, accessing resources and things while you were out in Florida? Now, not that easy. Um, here, they'll assist you once or twice or so. Getting on the bus if you don't have the fare down there, you stand no chance. Tell me what like a day looked like. You were where, where, where did you spend most of your time? We that? while we were homeless in Florida, we spent it within downtown Miami. Tell me what like a regular day would look like if you were in downtown Miami. Well, while we were in downtown Miami, a regular day would be getting up at the crack of dawn. Um, we'd have to get up by like 4 o'clock in the morning to walk to the first meal by 6. Um, after that, there really wasn't any place for lunch unless you wanted to walk about 4 miles to get to, you know, um, a place called Camilla's House. And even then, you had to be one of the first, like, 50 people to get in. If not, you didn't stand a chance at a shower. 
really, I mean, there were showers where we got breakfast, but those were very limited in time and days of the week that you could go. Um, you know, getting our mail was a problem. Getting access to spare food resources. There really is no food pantries. But the meals that came around in the evening time were all right. There was this one group that came out on Thursday nights. They always had the best food out of all the feedings. They played music. They gave out clothes, backpacks, whatever you needed, they came up with it. And that group was called One World, One Heart. Okay, One World, One Heart. Like and you can find them on Instagram, actually, at One World, One Heart. Um, go ahead and follow them because I used to DJ for them when I had a place in Miami um, with my soon-to-be ex-spouse. Um, I had a pair of Bluetooth speakers or one big one and I used to transport it just across this uh, drawbridge, maybe six blocks altogether, you know, three on one side of the bridge, three on the other essentially. And uh, I'd be there, I'd set up, I'd do my mic check, I'd do my sound check. And nobody ever had a problem with the music that I played. And nobody, and people just, they weren't comfortable having a transgender around, but One World, One Heart was very comfortable, very opening, open, and very welcoming. Um, on the weekends, though, that was the party. Every weekend, it'd be food from morning, from dawn till dusk. Different churches, different groups. They bring hygiene packs, clothes, food. Oh, my God. There was a group that brought tables and chairs. I set up like a buffet line each weekend. Oh, that was the best. That was absolutely the best. We made some friends down there and so on. But it was very rough. It was violent. Yeah. But, um, God, don't you love how people drive? They never move over for vehicles. But, you know, I mean, it was as rough as it was, you know, my partner got attacked and it stirred up some trouble. Um, someone that I thought was a friend. And uh, we had an argument, me and my partner, that morning. Me and Vox. And uh, so... You know, I said, listen, meet me at the library. I guess my partner, Vox, may not have remembered clearly that the library was only two blocks and around the corner away from where we were sleeping under an overpass by 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street in downtown Miami. So, um, you know, I had told him that, you know, if you really don't feel comfortable going somewhere, just go to the library or go to government center and the library's right across the street. This government center was only two blocks away. Yeah. And so this friend who I thought was a friend, him and his wife, they, um, you know, they had gone back to their original campsite, which was out by Miami International Airport, like in a wooded area. Were you living in like a tent or were you just staying out? Oh no, we were in a tent. We were out on the sidewalk. Um, Miami kind of now has an anti-camping ordinance. The same as uh, Boston. Yep. Within the city limits. But um, it just... Uh, it, it just made things all that more difficult. We never had an issue with law enforcement and having our tent up because we found a way not to block the entire sidewalk and keep our area clean. We always had garbage bags and clothing lines that, you know, overnight we can dry things. You know, if it rained overnight, the, you know, the, the city never really cared that we were drying our stuff because it was neat. It wasn't left all over the ground. You know, we, we didn't trash the area that we stayed in. But um, I wound up having to go to Jackson Memorial Hospital to deal with the aftermath of the attack. Um, not too long after that, we wound up dealing with this one gentleman yeah. who thought he was a big shot. 
on drugs. It's sad. Addiction is a nasty beast. Thought that he was like the king of downtown until I literally wound up teaching him a lesson. Uh, the LGBTQ liaison for um, the Miami Police Department happened to be in the area and um, called out over the microphone in a car that this gentleman needed to leave me and my partner alone or the consequences were definitely on him. Mind you, the First Amendment is freedom of speech and it protects hate speech, but it only goes to a certain limit. Okay. When you incite insurrection or violence of any kind, whether it be self-harm or harm to others based on race, creed, sexual orientation, sexual identity, gender preference, or um, even relationship preference, age, skin color, it doesn't matter. Once you start to incite any sort of dangerous situation where you're in harm's way or somebody else is in harm's way or trying to create almost like a coup d'etat or to get somebody to harm somebody for you, um, that's when your First Amendment right stops. That's when you surrender that right. Um, and so that's exactly what this gentleman did. He was warned by this police officer. And it got to a point where he decided that he just had to say one more hateful thing. And the cop got out of the car, came across to you and said, listen, if they decide to beat the ever-loving grace out of you, there's nothing I can do about it. Because you are literally antagonizing this couple for your own sick pleasure just to call them out. And by calling them out, you're putting them in danger. They have every right to defend themselves by whatever means under the laws of equal force. And so he picked up a small stone and threw it and it hit me in the back of the leg. And as Vox is watching, even Vox tells me, please don't do something, please. I ignore him. I turn around. And I coughed at this guy so hard with my left foot, I broke my big toe. And I trashed about 10, oh, maybe like two to four teeth. Put him down his throat. I literally took the ever-loving breath of Jesus out of him. And when I was done, I simply asked him and said, Do you, would you kiss your mother with that mouth? Would you talk to your girlfriend with that mouth? Either you're so afraid that you got all nothing else to say other than this spiteful, hateful crap. Or it's because maybe you just dated a transgender, didn't know, and when they finally whipped it out, it's like you're going to get some hanky-panky. Instead of seeing a nice cat, you saw a big fat pipe. So it sounds like you had like a, uh, like you had some, some trouble out there in Florida. So what? It's nothing but trouble down there. What made you decide? Like, What was it that made you decide to come back up to Massachusetts? Drag shows. Okay. Remember, I got a drag name. I am a drag queen. The drag name. You can follow me on Instagram. You can tip at Venmo at Foxine Vagina, JC. That's F O U X I N E V A G H I N A, JC. And being homeless and a drag queen is not easy when all your stuff keeps getting stolen. I am in great need and support of proper stage wear, makeup hair piece, whatever people feel that they wish to donate, they can send if they want. If they're mailing items or sending items to 67 Newberry Street, please send them to Freitas Lothbrook, F-R-E-Y-D-I-S-L-O-T-H-B-R-O-K at 67 Newberry Street, Boston, Massachusetts, 02116. Also, are in need of even just everyday attire for my partner. 
which both of us, thank God, are the same size. Well, not exactly in the chest. I have to wear prosthetics a little different, but we're both XLs. They are a women's nine, a men's seven and a half. I am a size 12 in men's shoe, size 12 to 13 in women's heels, boots, what have you, clothing and supplies, even sleeping bags. The weather's about to get cold. Uh, pretty much whatever would be much, much appreciated. So, yeah, like it's fun to get rough out here. How it was like when I first came out here, it was just coming in the winter. Um, you know, you ended up going down south. I stayed out here all winter and I had to figure that out. Hey, but we kept in touch, though. We did. So, uh, one thing that I did admire about you two when I came across you again out here in the city is that we stayed together. Yes. We supported each other. You know, like, I know it's hard on you. I know it's a struggle. But I can imagine it's a struggle. Well, I mean, when your partner has DID, um, which is disassociative, identity disorder uh, yeah I mean my partner deals with 185 other personalities other than their own so it literally is a challenge and then being diabetic and having your insulin stolen and waiting months only finding out that your soon to be ex changed your address and had your insurance shut off and uh not being able to get on insulin, finally getting back insulin, getting on it. Um, there's a lot, you know, it, it very much so is rough. Being out in the street, even just being homeless, even if you're in a living in a car, it's extremely stressful. And, uh, you know, it, it's not for the faint of heart to live this life. How's it been like having like the two of you uh, both being transgender? You as a she and him as a he. Uh, like, how has it been? Like, has there been like? I, I, well, I know the answer to this, but I want you. To this, like, how has it been with like judgment, discrimination? You know, like that feeling of uncomfortableness of having to confront others, or like the way that they treat you or look at you. Like, what? Like, what, what's the impact of that? It's. It's it, it for. I'm going to let my drag queen out on this one and be as raunched as I can for the truth of things is it's a walking clusterfuck. I mean, it is so asinine that the behaviors are experienced literally day to day. I mean, we're both, my partner is exterior is female, although he identifies as he, he, they, and I identify as she, they, she, her. I mean, because I have a male exterior, I'm looked at different. Even at women's lunch place, I can be looked at very different or treated differently. And my partner is the same. He, she, you know, he can't identify as he, they, or he has no access to services. So even there, you know, he has to identify as she, her like me in order to even to have a case manager or to receive uh you know a little bit of food or catch a shower or do laundry you know have a place to rest you know that's not sitting and laying in a park or or on a bench or panhandling in the streets it's somewhere safe you know? so like at this stage, like, what, what, what do you think, like, the next steps are? What's your plans? Well, I just got my Social Security card back. I got my Massachusetts ID. Right. Not the real ID. Um, I had a Florida driver's license. I switched over to Massachusetts state identification because, well, I, um, you know, I didn't have the funds ready to transfer, and I have to right. retake the driver's exam. And because of the diabetes, my eyesight isn't all that great. It's good, don't get me wrong, I can see. But just certain distances become problematic. Um, you know, other than that, that's 
you know, what it is. I mean, my partner just got their social security card back. Actually, it's the first one actually they've ever had. Okay. Um, they're waiting for the final approval for their birth certificate from uh, Tampa, okay. Florida, and then they'll be going to process for their uh, Massachusetts ID from there. Um, I'm waiting to see the primary care physician with Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. Love you guys. Great people. Um, so I can get a referral for me and my partner to go through this program through Mass General that's called the Flexible Housing Program. Okay. Um, I'm also seeing a, a therapist so I can go ahead and start um, getting my hormones together, even my hormone replacement to be on estrogen. Um, all of this takes time, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's getting done. It's Life is all about learning, and when we learn, we learn how to take those baby steps. And you can't run and you can't jog, you can't walk until you learn how to crawl. You know, that's why it's so evident and clear in life that when a baby is born, they don't even know how to crawl yet. That's It's innately built into our program, genetically. So when a baby learns to roll on their stomach, you first learn how to roll over, crawl, stand up. Then once you learn how to stand up, you figure that out, you start walking. When you start walking, inevitably you learn how to jog, and before you know it, you're running. The life is all about learning, even with our pronouns. It's clear that, you know, we're going to face discrimination just because of who we are. So, like, all right, now I'm going to go a little deeper with this. Because, like, I've been going through this for a year. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of people. Um, I've noticed, like, a theme, like, the theme of relationships. I've seen a lot of people that are homeless that will stay by themselves. And I've noticed, you know, like I've interacted and I've noticed there's always a standoffishness. Um, you know, like this reluctance to communicate, you know, or be interested to like sit down and do an interview like this, where I've seen like a lot of homeless people that will kind of group together and then they'll form relationships. And it's like, I see this more social sociability about them. Um, like you're a very social person, you know. Of course. You notice you've always kept friends and like a group of people that you kind of roll with, and you haven't lost like you know that that kind of social aspect. Um, and I think like one of the things that I've noticed and I notice a lot is like the people that are isolated more, the people that are more social is. I start to notice that there's like a. Um, the spitefulness like towards humanity towards people you know like that constant struggle that constant letdown um you know i see it in its worst with people that are isolated and lonely but i also see it in people that tend to build relationships with other people that might be living homeless like what's your feeling about this like that overall feeling that experience of you know being a social person the way that you are but being homeless and having the experience like you know, like the rejection and i Whatever. You know, in the beginning of when I first became homeless, I really wasn't all that social. I was scared and nervous. I mean, you know, it, it's a scary life. It's not easy when you realize you don't have anybody in your corner. Everyone's turned their back on you. Your family is not there to assist or guide or to help, you know, um, that... You know, it, it can be very rough. And I learned to be more social by building relationships and making friends. And, you know, I, I didn't want to go to the store for half of the people when I first became homeless to go buy beer. I wasn't comfortable. But, you know, I said, you know, I need to know resources of where they're at. And Broward County wasn't really a friendly place. Some of the BSO officers got to know me. They saw that, you know, I was not the troublemaker. But at the time, my fiancé was. Um, and, you know, she was a troublemaker. So I was always out walking the streets looking for her at night. 
because she was drunk or laid up in some other dude's bed or what have you. But I always watch my back and always watch the backs of others. Because before I became homeless, when I worked in armed security, uh, tactical enforcement, my FTO, Hector Torres, a sergeant with the United States, or what used to be, now is retired from the United States Army and Marine Corps. Um, he always told me, learn the job of the people below you and above you. Because you'll never know when you become that leader. And it's not going to be just because. You're doing a good job or you're doing, a, 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 you know, making alliances or acquiring new posts or positions or what have you. You're doing it because, you know, you're, you're getting noticed and doing the things you do because it's an integral part of who you are. Us as humans, we're not meant to be antisocial. We're meant to be very sociable Creatures, you know, take a sugar glider, for example. The way that they're a sugar, a sugar glider, a little marsupial from Australia, adorable freaking things, is they're so highly sociable that they form little colonies with up to 10 or more adults in one nest. Even while they carry their joeys, the babies, in the mother's pouch, they still just stay very social. And if they're all by themselves, even as pets, as some people are, you know, have, if they're not kept in a very social atmosphere, they wind up becoming depressed and show signs of depression and wind up passing away. They don't eat, they don't drink, they're not interactive. Um, they're very bonding animals. They, they, they need to know that that bond is there. Even with their human owners, you can't just have one or that's the outcome. Look at rats, for example. Rats are the same way. They live by a society um, hierarchy, a social hierarchy. You know, they, they live as like one big colony. They all work together to find food and, you know, we've been hunters and gatherers since the beginning of days for us. We hunted as a group, we gathered as a group, made homes, made clothing as a group, you know, prepared food as a group. Everything that we do is socially based. Just because we don't now, we're not going out into restaurants and bars or out to Central Park, for example, you know, going to events or concerts to meet people and to interact. We interact through social media now. Do I feel that's a better method? No, I like the older days where you wanted to meet a nice boy or a nice girl. You went to the bar, you went out to like a little social club or so and or you got involved with like the, your local YMCA or WYMCA and you know, you did things the old-fashioned way. You built a level of trust with somebody that's genuine, not where you can just copy and paste by clicking a button or a mouse or pressing a screen on a phone and you now take somebody else's image and make it your own. So you're saying technology is driving us to a more levels of, a higher level of isolation. Rate. Exactly. All the social media does, I mean... It's good to promote businesses. It's good to, you know, keep in touch with family or to make friends or even build relationships. Yes, but when it becomes the center point of your entire existence, what your natural programming as sociable is becomes antisocial. And once you get on the street, that's all you really have is YouTube, TikTok, Scoops, Twitter, X, Facebook. That's like the only way for you to really interact until you relearn the basics of how to 
form a bond or a relationship, even as a friendship with somebody. Okay. Um, and of course, bonding and creating relationships when you're homeless is almost like a real technique of survival. It's like a key. Survival. Because you won't know where to find the information on feedings or clothing or showers or laundry or provisions of any kind if you don't ask somebody so the whole general basis of who we are is as we have been for thousands of years as social creatures so at this point right like where you're at now like what, what do you think like if you had advice if you were to give people advice like what type of advice would you give people that might end up out in the street homeless in Boston or another city or a town what, what's, what's the advice that you would give personally as a drag queen I would say live it it's time to get it get that money honey but falling into reality is you know you have to remember in society today the way our economy is going our country is being viewed uh, in and of itself is the problem is at home not abroad you know it's good to support our allies and everything but if we can't figure out the correct solutions at home what happens when you lose your job you can't pay your bills you can't pay your rent you, you, you can't afford your car anymore you can't afford a cell phone and now you're out in the cold because you don't even know how to ask somebody hey can I borrow a couple of bucks to eat to keep yourself alive you know I mean if you can't figure out that if you don't show the type of heart and soul and kindness required to help those that may truly need the help at the end of the day when you fall off your high horse and you can't get another job before the rent is due you know it takes time to acquire new jobs and to make new relationships and you know earn money it's tough nowadays what do you think? Like, what's the advice? Like, what advice? The advice is remember those below you that don't have and show the kindness that you have. That's true. Because, you know, without it, when you fall, remember those that you turned your back on will turn their back on you. So you need to help those that don't have, that need that show of kindness. And it will always come back to you before you realize it. The other day, somebody gave me $120. A couple of months ago. Gave me $120. I didn't really want to spend any of it on, on, on anything. But I have nothing. I literally just passed that bike right here. Just passed your bike is all of our life. Yeah. Me and Vox. And I'll tell you. I decided that I was going to go and buy a few 7-Eleven pizzas, some smokes, a couple of beers, and pass it around. So be generous. Be like, generous. Wherever you are in life. Wherever you generous. are. Even if, you're, even if you have nothing to give, just sit down and talk to somebody that is worse off than you, that doesn't have the same thing you have. Because maybe they couldn't afford their rent because they lost their job or because of COVID a while ago, they lost their everything due to COVID or, or, you know, they live with their mother and their mother passed away, their father, their brother, whomever. You have to remember the people that don't have, and society looks at how you interact with the other. When you show society that you're there, truthfully and genuinely, society always rewards you. Okay. All right, well... I would, you, you know, I wish, wish you all the best. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Vox is kind of in his headspace and is being shy, but if he could be interviewed and wanted to be interviewed, guarantee he'd tell you the same advice. And that's fine. You know, and I just, I think it's good that you're still together, still taking care of each other, and 
I just pray that you find a, a way out of the streets, especially before winter, and you find a place where you can, you know, start working on building futures for yourselves. Thank you. Well, for now we'll say good night, and I appreciate you. And uh, it's been about a year, so um, hopefully the future has good things in store for us. Of course.